Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of Decoding the Unknown. As always, I'm your host Simon. Welcome, welcome. Written today by Katie. The mystery of the Tunguska event. Exploring the 1908 explosion in Siberia. I didn't realize, I mean, I know there was a bit of a historical mystery around this, but didn't they work it out? Is that a comet or an asteroid that came towards the Earth and then BOOM! Blew up a little bit of water around and knocked down a bunch of trees. But there was no crater and stuff, but I think that's because they figured it out eventually. It just exploded above the trees. I think. I'm not entirely sure. I've almost certainly made a video on this before, and everyone's going to be like, Simon, don't you remember making this video? I'm going to be like, no, it's like four years ago. I don't remember what I had for lunch yesterday. Jesus. Anyway, the format of the show, I've never read it before. Uh, Katie's written it for me. My job is just to read it. That's all I do. It's the best job in the world. Let's go. <laughs> There's nothing like a giant explosion to set imaginations alight, especially if there are few witnesses, no investigation for over a decade, and not much in the way of physical evidence to work out what happened. Today we're investigating the 1908 Tunguska event, a huge explosion that affected the planet from the Siberian wastelands to the English coast. Oh my god, wait, that's really far. Was it? I mean, I know it was a big explosion, but I didn't realize it was that big. While we think we've pretty much got a handle on what happened these days, there's always room for alternative theories, and oh, when something like this happens, you know some of those theories are going to be good, and by good, we don't mean particularly well thought out or credible, we just mean straight up weird. Yeah, honestly, this show, right, I do, a, I do several YouTube channels if you're not familiar with my other body of work, and they're very much like, this is what happens, and then this happens, and then this happens, and I hope it's entertaining, and I hope it's educational, but generally it's good when we have information. In this show, it's good when we have something entertaining that is just wild ass crazy. And I love it. I love it. What was the Tunguska event? Imagine that you're a reindeer in early 20th century Russia. <laughs> I do every day, Katie. You're hanging out by the pod Blah, blah, blah. That's a very long word in Russian that I can't read. It's a river. And you've got your pals Yuri, Lev, and Alina. It's the 30th of June, 1908, or if you're still using the Julian calendar as Russian was at the time, it's the 17th of June, 1908. Didn't they miss the Olympics because of this one year? They were like using the wrong calendar, or like their calendar, and the Olympics was on the other calendar. And they were like, oh, <laughs> Let me interrupt today's video to tell you about our fantastic sponsor, and that would be one that's going to bring a little bit of excitement to your life, and that's Bespoke Post. You see, Bespoke Post is like that friend who always brings the coolest stuff to the party. It's a monthly membership club that delivers a box of awesome, which is packed with top shelf goodies from under the radar brands. And guess what? Totally free to join. You can skip a month or cancel any time. And what makes Bespoke Post even better is that a whopping 90% of the products come from small brands, many of which are based in the US. Every month, they introduce you to some seriously cool products, think outdoor gear, barware, home and kitchen goodies, and even stylish clothing, all based on a preference quiz that you fill out. It's like having that friend who's very good at choosing birthday gifts send you something every month. That's nice. And here's the kicker. Every box of awesome is jam-packed with around $70 worth of goodies, but it's yours for only a fraction of that price. But before your box ships, you get to see what's inside, and you can decide whether you want to keep it, swap it for a different box, or skip the month entirely for no charge. You only pay for what you want. You're not locked in. For example, there's the Weekender box. This is perfect for spontaneous getaways. It comes with a sleek duffel bag that's made with durable cotton canvas and leather handles, as well as metal hardware. It's even got a space for your laptop. Or you can choose the Salud box. It's an authentic margarita kit from Mexico, including hand-blown glasses, a juicer, margarita agave, spicy chili salt, and Mexican dish towel. All you have to add is tequila and citrus, and you're good to go. So here's the scoop. To get a fabulous 20% off your first box of awesome, click the link in the description below and enter the promo code UNKNOWN20 at checkout. Or just visit bespokepost.com slash unknown20. And now back to today's video. If you were a reindeer, I suppose you didn't really care one way or the other. The day is clear and calm. You're just moseying about eating whatever reindeer eat when suddenly your attention is caught by a cylindrical object shooting across the sky. Odd, you think. You nudge Alina. But she's not that interested, and Yuri and Lev are too far away, so you just continue munching. The pipe-shaped object gets brighter and brighter, so it's like there are two suns, and then the sky fills with smoke. Banging noises like boulders tumbling or those things humans shoot at each other fill the air. The earth shakes like you've never known, and everywhere around you trees are crashing over. <laughs> if you ever look up in the sky, if you're just hanging out outside one day, and, there are, and it appears that there are two suns in the sky, you're there's the reason there are two suns in the sky is never good. It's never like, oh yeah, no, it's just it's just extra bright today. <laughs> You're f Yuri and Lever flattened by the falling trees. No, Yuri! 
Alina is burned to a crisp and all you see is blackness as your life swiftly comes to an end. See, I told you, it's never a good thing. Sorry, reindeer, you've just become a victim of the Tunguska event. I did originally make your outcome a happy ending, but I felt this was more realistic as lots of reindeer did indeed perish. Oh no, not the reindeer. Let us get into more detail. As we said, it was a clear day in the area of Siberia that is located in what is currently known as the Krasnoyarsk Cry, but back in 1908 it was part of the Yeniseisk Governorate. This incident is known as the Tunguska event as it took place by the Podkamenaya, that river again, Tunguska River. We may just refer to the area as Tunguska as we go along, and I'm sure you know you'll know what we mean. It also means it have to pronounce the, the first part, which is nice. While the area was and remains very sparsely populated, there were some people who witnessed the event, and articles were published shortly afterward in various Russian newspapers. The accounts were all quite similar, with people variously describing the start as an intense light in the sky. Our native Evenki tribesmen reported, quote, The morning was sunny, there were no clouds. Our sun was shining brightly as usual, and suddenly there came a second one. Wait, this guy survived? He saw a second sun in the sky and he's like, oh, I lived a day that tell the tale. While the Sabir newspaper wrote of some strangely bright, impossible to look at, bluish white heavenly body. This bright light moved downwards towards the earth, and as it did, it turned into a giant billow of black smoke, according to Sabir. After that came a pillar of fire and an explosion so intense that it knocked down trees across an area of 2,150 square kilometers, which is 830 square miles, which is absolutely massive, which is one and a third times the size of London, or two and a half times the size of New York City. <laughs> It flattened trees. That is massive. With this explosion came shockwaves that registered as si at seismic stations across the globe and noise that was described by witnesses as if rocks were falling or cannons were firing. A loud thunderclap as if large stones were falling or artillery was fired. Lots of, they, these were all separate quotes and it sounds like stones falling down was the big one. And I mean, I guess it is a kind of stone falling down, isn't it? A stone falling down from the heavens. This was accompanied by intense heat, hot winds and ground tremors. The explosion had happened in a remote area, but buildings still have shattered windows and other minor damage the closest were at least 65 kilometers or 40 miles from the epicenter but even those hundreds of kilometers away felt the effects anecdotally it's been said that up to three people might have been killed during the events but officially the confirmed confirmed death toll is a remarkable zero that's not counting the reindeer obviously an estimated 80 million trees were felled holy shit. all falling outwards from the blast center in the middle of the blast zone stood a few remaining trees, upright, br branchless, and burned black. According to Britannica.com, quote, The energy of the explosion is estimated to have been equivalent to the explosive force as as much as 15 megatons of TNT, a thousand times more powerful than the atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima, Japan, on August the 6th, 1945. A thousand times Hiroshima. And you've seen those photos of Hiroshima afterwards. It was not pretty. The explosion had been visible from over 800 kilometers, that's 500 miles away, and for a day afterward, the night skies over Europe remained strangely bright, with people taking photographs at night without the need for a flash and reports of others in London able to read at midnight with no other light source. Wait, why? Why would there be so much light afterwards? Tell me. There was no one there to record the sound of the explosion, but it has been estimated that it could have reached over 300 decibels making it one of the loudest sounds in history i recently or not so recently but heard this amazing thing that so the sun right it we can't hear the sun because obviously sound doesn't travel through a vacuum and there's a really big vacuum between us and the sun but apparently if we could hear the sun it's so f loud that if there wasn't a vacuum and we're still super far away from the sun the entire earth it would sound like a train is going past like everywhere you are will just be like a train going past like all the time because that's how loud the sun is imagine being closer to the sun and there not being a vacuum you're like it's so loud what is now known as the tunguska event or tunguska incident was the largest impact event on our planet in the time at the time in recorded history however can it be called an impact event if no crater has ever been found why wasn't there any sort of scientific expedition to the area until 1921 and even then not to the actual site of the explosion until 1927 well, I don't know. People are really busy. Like, and it's in the middle of nowhere. As we said at the beginning, the event does have a rational explanation, if some of the finer details are still being quibbled over. But let's explore some of the other theories that people have thought up over the years. Ah, yes, the good stuff. 
And by good, I mean laughable. Let's have a laugh. It was a UFO. Oh, it wasn't though, was it? Well, it was a UFO to begin with. An unidentified flying ob- well, <laughs> yeah, fair, fair play. An unidentified flying object streaked across the sky before exploding into a Siberian forest. As there wasn't anyone who was particularly close when it happened, and no investigation was carried out for years, it could not initially be confirmed what the object was, but you know we're talking about alien spacecraft here, not just being pedantic about what UFO stands for. While the original witnesses didn't make any mention of potential alien activity, the mysterious nature of some of the details of the event, plus Russia's well-renowned love of obfuscation, which is a tricky word to say, ended up spawning more than one theory about extraterrestrial visitors, and some even saying that it was Russia's equivalent to Roswell. <laughs> Holy sh**, was a bit of a bigger exp- Ros Roswell was a like military plane crashing, and then they were like, oh, the balloon, but it was a military plane crashing. This was 300 decibels and flattened trees in an area bigger than the entirety of London. <laughs> London's really big and sprawling. One theory that's easy to disprove is that of a Martian spaceship coming to Earth for repairs, but instead blowing up. The spacecraft was powered by some sort of nuclear device, thus resulting in the gigantic explosion. Sure, cool, 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 but where are the parts of the ship? Well, would you believe it that in 2004, Russian media was alight with claims that extraterrestrial spaceship fragments had indeed been found at the site of the Tunguska event? Let me guess, that turned out to be false. <laughs> What's that? Ah, oh, we think it's part of an alien. No, that's part of a tractor, mate. It's just part of a tractor. C clearly. Look, it's made out of iron. It's all rusty and sh**. Think the aliens had some rusty shit spacecraft? Come on. Yuri Lavbin, a member of the Tunguska Space Phenomenon Foundation, had headed an expedition to the Tunguska region and had found a metallic block that was widely reported as being from an extraterrestrial spaceship. So was it? It's not clear. As while Lavbin had it sent it off for testing, he didn't bother to wait for any results before making all of his statements to the press, so it hardly matters what the block was made of now that he's already had his moment in the sun. Also, he found this block some way outside the normal agreed perimeter of the blast as he decided the object was headed in a different direction to where all the original eyewitnesses said it was going. He also decided to conclude that this proved that an alien spaceship had actually saved the planet from an incoming meteorite by blasting said meteorite to pieces and the bit he found was part of that device. Bro, that is some wild ass speculation. <laughs> so you're just making it up. It's literally just making it up. So what could this object have been? Well, it's possible that it was space related, but unfortunately originating very much from this planet. Russia has had a very vigorous space program, and in 1960, a test flight of a Vostok 5 came down right near the Tunguska event area. Debris from that capsule is likely what lab been found. That's a hell of a lot more interesting than some random tractor part, isn't it? If he didn't plant anything himself, that is, and control panels and the general configuration of parts would not be familiar or easily recognizable by non-astronauts or space engineers. Also, Lavbin had started his quest with the express intention of finding evidence of aliens. He said, quote, We intend to find proof that not a meteorite, but an extraterrestrial spaceship crashed with the Earth. And so, voila! Mission accomplished, I guess. Yeah, that's what you have... <sighs> just come up with a hypothesis. Don't be like, I'm going to look for an alien spacecraft that I know is there, because then you're just going to find evidence of it, even if it's not really evidence. If you go in, I'm curious. I'm curious. I'd like to find out more. Much better attitude to have. It's sort of how I enter these things. Like, as much as I make fun of it, I genuinely would like to find something where I'm like, I can't explain that. There's absolutely no rational way thing that explains that. I'd like to find that. I do have, I, I do have, despite my making fun, I like to think quite a malleable mind. Like, I will be open to having my opinion changed. I just need a weight of evidence. And obviously, this is not it! There have been many other believers in the alien aspect of the Tunguska event, with the nuclear engine of a spacecraft especially being a rich breeding ground for this theory. Because of the magnitude of the blast and the blast pattern of the trees, some sort of nuclear explosion has regularly been touted. 1908 was a wee bit early for humans to have been experimenting with nuclear bombs, but maybe the Martians already had it down. Scientist Alexei Zolotov was convinced this was the source of the explosion and visited the site to carry out tests. Is an actual scientist doing this? He's like, yeah, it was aliens. Okay. While officially no significant radioactivity has been found at the event area, ruling out any kind of early or extraterrestrial nuclear shenanigans, Zolotov has claimed he found elevated levels, although no proof has ever been given. Bro, you're a scientist. you got to provide proof. You know that. That's how science works. Another link that Zolotov has to the event, however, is a man called Alexander Kazantsev. The two were friends, and Kazantsev was a well-known science fiction writer. Uh-oh, that's different from being a scientist. 
After seeing the destruction of the atomic bomb at Hiroshima and Nagasaki and noting the similarities to the area around the Tunguska event, Kazantsev penned a fictional story about the Martian in the spacecraft looking to land but ultimately bowing out. So that's where the whole story came from in the first place. What's more difficult to work out is if Kazantsev wrote this in earnest or not. I've seen variously that it was all clearly supposed to be read as fiction, and also that this was his actual real-life theory for what happened at Tunguska. He was a ufologist and very interested in all things Martian, so it seems that fact and fiction just started blurring. Many people who believe the Martian theory may have read or been influenced by the stories Kazantsev wrote and not realize they were supposed to be fiction. Or maybe they weren't supposed to be fiction. As I said, it's hard to tell. What we can tell, however, is that no nuclear activity has been found at the site and no traces of extra terrestrial spaceships have ever been found, unless it was all picked up and taken away, of course. As previously mentioned, no real investigations were carried out until many years later, plenty of time to cover up traces of E.T. Let's face it, whenever there's something spotted in the sky and unsatisfactory investigations are carried out deep in the wilderness, talk of aliens is always going to pop up. If you thought that was far-fetched, however, get a load of this. Oh, okay, here we go. <laughs> More far-fetched than aliens. What is it? It was Jesus. <laughs> Jesus came down to earth and then he decided we weren't ready for him. Oh my god, if that's actually a theory, I'm gonna cry. <laughs> it was Nikola Tesla's death ray. <laughs> I don't think that's more absurd than aliens. Because <laughs> Nikola Tesla at least is real. <laughs> Bear with us here. In some circles, what happened in the Tunguska area was actually Tesla trying to demonstrate his awe-inspiring remote death ray by gate-crashing someone's polar expedition, but overshooting somewhat and instead destroying 80 million trees. Bit of an oopsie there. Is this even within the realm of possibility? Probably not, but let's address it anyway for a few minutes. In the early years of the 20th century, Nikola Tesla was all about wireless energy and the wireless transmission of power. He built a large transmission tower on an area of land in Long Island and called Called it Wardenclyffe. From here, he thought that as well as sending radio signals, he could also transmit power wirelessly to anywhere on the globe. Unfortunately, at this time, Tesla was being shoved out by financial baggers in favor of other investors such as Marconi, and a financial panic in the early 1900s left him pretty much penniless. There's just no way the amount of energy that you would require to do that, like we said, it's a thousand times more powerful than a nuclear bomb. That just was not happening at this point. In 1907, Tesla had made public comments about the destructive power of electrical waves, telling the New York Times, quote, As to projecting wave energy to any particular region of the globe, this can be done with my devices. He went on to confirm that it could be focused very accurately, providing you had the correct measurements. In 1908, just before the Tunguska event, he wrote to the editor of the New York Times again, stating, quote, When I spoke of future warfare, I meant that it should be conducted by direct application of electrical waves without the use of aerial engines or other implements of destruction. This is not a dream. Even now, wireless power plants could be constructed by which any region of the globe might be rendered uninhabitable without subjecting the population of other parts to serious danger or inconvenience. End quote. So, was Tesla saying that he had a remote weapon up and ready to go from Wardenclyffe Tower? When the Tunguska event occurred mere months later, there was no impact crater, no detailed eyewitness accounts of what had happened, and the devastation hit with a force of around 15 megatons of TNT, which was within the wheelhouse of what Tesla said his transmitter could produce. Ah, okay, so they were just at that time massively underestimating the amount of power that was released in that explosion. Because didn't we say it was like many, many thousands? So why there and why then? Tunguska death ray theorists postulate that Tesla was doing secret tests with his wireless weapon and wanted to make a big statement to prove to everyone his idea was viable. Um, well, okay, in that case, it wouldn't be much of a mystery, because Tesla would come out afterwards and be like, bro, you heard about that, like, asteroid or whatever that blew all those trees down, 80 million trees? He'll be like, that was no asteroid. I did that. I'm from Long Island. And everyone would be like, god damn, bro. <laughs> wow! Wow! <laughs> okay, and that's what we'd what we'd remember Tesla for instead of his electric cars. Around the same time as the two, that was a joke. That was a joke. It's like, so what are you talking about? What are you talking about? It's so just a joke. <laughs> I'm joking. That's just a joke. We like to have fun here. Around the same time as the Tunguska event, Admiral Robert Peary was trying to be the first person to reach the geographic North Pole. Tesla apparently wanted to focus his ray in the Arctic to create an event that Peary would immediately report back on. Then I guess Tesla would step out of the shadows and say that event at the North Pole that Peary witnessed. Ladies and gentlemen, that was me. I am Iron Man. <laughs> 
I'm not sure what kind of display he was envisioning. Did he want to etch Tesla was here in the ice? He could have easily killed Peary and his team, and the whole idea seems a bit of an odd way to demonstrate your new toy. Anyway, the idea goes that Tesla had miscalculated the coordinates to aim his death ray and ended up blasting hundreds of square miles of the Siberian forest instead. So, why has this given any credence at all? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I don't know, Katie. Please tell me. In yet another letter to his BFF, the editor of the New York Times, several years later, Tesla said that he had already made a powerful trans a transmitter powerful enough to wreak havoc wherever he wants it. In the 1915 letter he wrote, It is perfectly practical to transmit electrical energy without wires and produce destructive effects at a distance. I have already constructed a wireless transmitter which will make this possible. When unavoidable, it may be used to destroy property and life. In a letter to a previous investor, J.P. Morgan in 1934, Tesla seemed again to hint that he had created some sort of transmissible weapon to quote, The flying machine has completely demoralized the world, so much so that in some cities, as in London and Paris, people are in mortal fear from aerial bombing. The new means I have perfected afford absolute protection against this and other forms of attack. These new discoveries I have carried out experimentally on a limited scale create a profound impression. So, what do we think? Did Nikola Tesla, as a last-ditch effort to recoup interest and money from his investors and save his reputation, try to pull off a spectacular demonstration of a remote death ray, or teleforce weapon as he preferred to call it, but went to writ of right? Personally, I'm in the no camp here. Yes, Katie, you know who's also in the no, no camp here? Me. Because this was well over 100 years ago. Or over 100 years ago, 1934. Uh, uh, under 100 years ago. <laughs> and you know what we haven't done since then? Done this same thing. And it's been nearly 100 years, so come on. It's not real. Tesla never expressly mentioned or claimed credit for the Tunguska event, maybe because he was embarrassed that it missed his target, or more likely, because he had nothing to do with it at all. There is nothing in the way of solid evidence to connect him to the event in any way. It's mostly just coincidental wording that people have picked up on. There's also no real evidence that he had a working teleforce weapon in the first place, so the whole thing is just one big ball of rumor. There is little room for doubt when it comes to what really caused the Tunguska event, which unfortunately closes the door on Tesla's death ray. Sorry about that. It was a black hole. Okay, now that we got the silly stuff out of the way, we can hone in on the more realistic theories. <laughs> I mean, yeah, okay, such as a black hole falling into the planet. Initially, I didn't realize the black hole could fall anywhere, so this was news to me. In 1973, physicists Michael P. Ryan and Albert A. Jackson touted the theory that a small black hole had hit Tunguska River area and passed straight through the planet. This would explain the lack of crater, as the hole would be tiny. The appearance of this falling black hole would allegedly match eyewitnesses' descriptions, and the event would cause trees to fall as they did. This is like, that'd be so cool if it was true, but I don't think it's true. When I said small black hole earlier, this is just in terms of the size of the thing. Yeah, it would be absolutely microscopic, but it would weigh like as much as a city or something. The mass of it would be enormous. But wait, what happened to this mini black hole? Is it just sitting in the center of the Earth, biding its time? No, 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 it would just pass straight through it, it would just whip out the other side. I'm assuming through some ocean, which is why there's not some big crater on the other side or like big exit wound. No, of course not. If we believe this theory, then the black hole would have passed straight through the planet and popped out the other side in the Atlantic somewhere. Well, wouldn't this have caused another Tunguska-sized shockwave to register? And yes, it would, which is why we can discount the black hole theory. The only seismic activity recorded in England, say, corresponded with the amount of time the shockwaves took to travel from impact point in Siberia. If the black hole had blasted out again, the seismic activity that it would create would have been a lot closer to England and would have been recorded before the Tunguska activity reached it. This didn't happen, ergo there was no second exit blast ergo no black hole so moving on it's a shame it would have been cool it was a near miss asteroid okay now we're really done with the silly ones in this penultimate theory an asteroid the size of a football stadium basically just glanced off the earth's upper atmosphere before heading back out into the solar system in 2020 daniel krenikov and colleagues at the siberian federal university in russia created a model showing various different bodies moving through space they concluded that a huge iron meteorite could have produced the craterless impact point left glowing dust in the upper atmosphere and would not have left visible debris the team estimated that the asteroid would have been about 200 meters across which is about half the height of the Empire State Building. Had it hit the ground, the crater would have been about two miles or just over three kilometers right. Oh my god, space is scary. The article I read on astronomy.com said, maybe playing it down a bit, it would have had catastrophic effects on the biosphere, perhaps ending modern civilization. <laughs> playing it down, what would it have done? It would have killed us all, absolutely everything. There'd be no life left. A lucky escape for us then. This is a credible theory, although scientists usually go for the next one, which is... It was a comet explosion or asteroid explosion. 
all right here's the actual theory upon which most scientists agree these days although the details are not 100 percent solid a comet or part of a comet or asteroid or part of a larger asteroid headed for earth exploded in the atmosphere rather than hitting the ground this is also known as a meteor air burst or superbolide this accounts for witness sightings of the cylinder or tube moving through the sky the bright light and the subsequent dark smoke and fire Newspaper reports at the time even referred to it as a meteorite and unusual natural occurrence, so there was no real mystery even back then. As the body didn't hit the ground, it left no impact crater, but the force of the explosion was still massively strong, leaving those poor reindeer and trees with no chance. While the comet theory was all the rage for a while, as the glowing skies it left behind could have been the residue of the comet's tail, it's since been decided that, as a comet is made up of ice, it likely would not have lasted long enough in Earth's atmosphere to travel as far as it did. Our best guess at the moment is that it was a rocky or stony asteroid. I've seen size estimates from 37 to 60 meters wide and speed estimates from 54,000 kilometers per hour to 97,000. But either way, this asteroid met with atmospheric friction, heat, and pressure and annihilated itself between 5 and 10 kilometers above the Earth's surface. This is the right one, right? This is the one that I feel like I definitely am familiar with. Not the black holes, even though that was super cool. Definitely not the aliens and definitely not... What was the other one? I don't even remember, but it was silly. We already know that there was no impact crater, but surely there would be some sign of this asteroid. And, well, there is. There are tiny and microscopic spheres all over the area, in the soil and embedded in trees that have a chemical makeup not seen on Earth. They are of high nickel, low iron content, consistent with meteorites. While the comet versus asteroid debate goes back and forth, we can safely assume that it was a celestial body or even a smaller part of a larger body that came into contact with our atmosphere and exploded before it hit the ground. Now, before we wrap up, let's tie up a few loose ends we mentioned a few times that there was no scientific expedition out to the tunguska site until many years after the incident this wasn't really for any conspiracy reasons like the russians hiding all those traces of a ufo before letting the public loose on the area it was for a combination of reasons including the remoteness of the area and the fact that in the immediate aftermath of the impact nothing else really happened anyone venturing to the site would not have had access to any scientific tools that would have been able to give them much useful information and russia was going through a lot at the time coming off the back of a revolution and a whole lot of political upheaval yeah like i said it's really far away and they're really busy so just like busy 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 <laughs> Apparently, the native Evenki people were also not keen on having visitors to their lands as they saw the area as sacred. They wouldn't let anyone go near the site, even if they'd tried. With World War I starting a few years later, there wasn't any interest in funding a trip to see what happened until 1921. Meteorologist Leonid Kulik took a team to the Podkamenya Tunguska River Basin to see if any meteoric iron could be found, but the weather conditions were so hostile that they didn't even make it to the blast area. Jesus, you went a long way. <laughs> it wasn't until 1927 that he made it back. Six years later! What? What do you mean? With the help of Evenki people, who I guess had thawed on the issue by this point, Kulik assumed that a meteor had again hit the region, so he found a lack of crater surprising, but he took loads of samples and photos in several other visits that he made over the years. Now, there have been many research trips and studies done about the Tunguska event, most reaching the same conclusions, apart from Yuri Lavbin and his recent UFO finding mission. Some people have queried the state the trees were left in after the blast. Trees at the center of the explosion were scorched and had branches stripped off, but hadn't burned down and were still standing upright while trees all around had fallen down. If there had been fire, as reported by eyewitnesses at the time, why hadn't the whole forest been burned down, or at least the trees directly underneath the fire been burned to ash? How could they still be standing? This is due to the fact that the explosion happened high above and was not caused by a physical object hitting the ground. Witnesses of the atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima have reported a similar thing happened with trees. Branches were blown off, but the main trunk was left standing. As for the fire, according to Britannia.com, the radiant energy from such an explosion would be enough to, enough to ignite forests, but the subsequent blast wave would quickly overtake the fires and extinguish them. Thus, the Tunguska blast charred the forest, but did not produce a sustained fire. It's cool that we can figure all this stuff out afterwards, right? And it's like, that seems really crazy. And then you're like, yeah, this happens and that happens. And you're like, oh, yeah, <laughs> it makes sense. The Tunguska effect. Even though we basically know what caused the explosion over the Tunguska River area, the event and region is still referenced in popular culture as some sort of mysterious thing. It's been mentioned in Doctor Who, and there was an episode of The X-Files called Tunguska involving black oil, possible alien bacteria found in a meteorite, and experiments on prisoners. 
only the X-Files. I played a game on my old Nintendo DS called Secret Files Tunguska. However, I don't think I ever finished the game, as it's one where you can't move on until you've done everything in a certain area. I think I just got stuck at some point. Nowadays, I'll just cheat by looking online. But I guess I had more integrity back then. And <laughs> also, you couldn't just go online. Everyone else remember, what was that website? There was a big website back in the day. That I can imagine it in my mind. It was like one of these cheat code websites. Cheat code CC! <laughs> And it just had like listings of cheat codes. And in my mind, it's like just this old website and they'd have like walkthroughs, I think, and like completion guides and stuff. This was like one of the first websites that I ever went on, for sure. I wonder if Cheat Code CC is still around. Is it? That'd be amazing. It's not going to look anything like it did in the 90s, is it? Cheat Code CC. Oh, it's still a Google search recommend. It is! It is! Hey! Wow, it does still look dated even though it's obviously more up to date than it was i can't believe that's still a thing oh that's amazing many authors have used the tunguska event as inspiration including the aforementioned alexander kazentsev in 2013 a show called siberia aired which was filmed in the style of a reality show here's part of the synopsis from indb in 1908 an unexplained event occurred deep in the remote siberian territory of tunguska now a hundred plus years later 16 reality show participants descend on tunguska unknowing of the land's mysterious past these contestants from varied walks of life will attempt to battle the elements and each other in a quest to survive of the harsh winter and claim a large cash prize what is initially met with unbridled enthusiasm quickly turns to sheer panic as a series of strange events begin to occur oh okay so it's like a mockumentary or like a mock reality tv show it sounds like alone you know that show where they go out in canada canada it's in vancouver right vancouver island i don't know that's in canada or maybe that's america there's that weird line right because there was that thing with the war or whatever where canada got divided and there's that i think vancouver island despite being called vancouver island is actually in america which is odd anyway all these people go to vancouver island and they live there with like nothing it's quite a good tv show i watched a couple of seasons of it and then it got a bit repetitive so i stopped watching but i'll probably go back to that it's pretty wild like there was one dude who gave up on the first day because there was like a bed it's like yeah bro <laughs> you <laughs> you're me in this show I'd, I'd be out of there first day i wouldn't spend a night I'll be like, why did I sign up for it in the first place? And then the answer would, of course, be money. The show actually sounds quite good, but spoiler alert, it was filmed in Canada. <laughs> good heaven again. We live on a spinning rock surrounded by lots of other spinning, falling, burning, and flying things. So what are the chances that another Tunguska event, or something even worse, could occur? Quite high, as it turns out. While an extinction-level event such as a massive meteorite crashing into us only happens extremely rarely, smaller things make it through all the time. According to the Royal Museum's Greenwich website, the real risk is possibly from the small, more frequent asteroids. We expect a 10-meter meteorite to hit every year, causing a 100-meter crater. Maybe only one in ten would hit a populated area, but considering the average density of England, that once a decade strike could still kill 12 people. So, statistically, it's really not worth worrying about. <laughs> I mean, I feel bad for those 12 people, but it's not going to be you, statistically. In February 2013, a mini Tunguska event took place again over Russia. Oh, I've heard of this one. This time in Chelyabinsk Blast area. This was where, like, people had, like, dash cams at this point, right? So there's, like, film, there's, like, videos of this thing, like, <laughs> ripping through the sky. Pretty cool. We have lots of photographic uh, and video evidence of it this time, and you can clearly see the meteor enter the Earth's atmosphere before exploding with an intense light that was apparently brighter than the sun. It was about a third the size of the Tunguska meteor and released about 30 times the energy of the Hiroshima atomic bomb. While no deaths were reported, over 7,000 buildings were damaged, with over 1,400 people sustaining injuries relating to the indirect effects caused by the shockwave. Perhaps the most concerning aspect of this event is that no one knew it was coming. Because of its relatively small size and the fact that it was headed our way during the day, the sun disguised it somewhat, and at the time it was not picked up by any observatories on the ground. Luckily, it exploded away from a highly populated area, and humanity got away unscathed again. So, how are we doing 10 years after this last surprise attack? Surely, we can blast anything that threatens us out of the sky, right? No shot, it's only been 10 years. <laughs> we haven't, like, magically built space lasers because of this. No one even died. <laughs> and even if it did hit a city, the death toll would be in the millions. And it would be terrible, but, I mean, what are you going to do about it? <laughs> Planetary astronomer Professor Alan Fitzsimmons says, Technology has come a long way in terms of how you can detect asteroids even as small as Chelyabinsk. Whoa! Wow! Okay, never mind, I take it back. In 10 years? But uh, 10 years in science terms. Oh, I guess it's a really long time. Because, like, science goes far. I was thinking, like, science moves quite slowly. 
but it doesn't really does it like 10 years ago shit was backwards <laughs> we didn't even have chat gpt <laughs> we didn't have chat gpt this time last year <laughs> the past was the worst but there's still a chance that one could sneak through and it's quite likely that the next significant asteroid that we have will be unannounced well thanks for that alan <laughs> that makes me feel so much better mate thank you there are also other political factors in play now that weren't such hot potatoes in 2013, such as a war in Ukraine and ongoing tensions between the US and China regarding spy balloons and other unidentified flying objects. An unannounced meteor making a cameo appearance could be cause for all kinds of flash responses. But there are systems being put in place which might help us avoid a collision with a near-Earth object, or NEO, or another meteor airburst. In 2022, NASA and Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory tested their DART program, which stands for Double Asteroid Redirection Test, and basically involved crashing a spacecraft into an asteroid to see if it could change its course. And it worked! This is useful for larger asteroids that we know are there, though not the smaller ones, such as those which have got through so far. If you're wondering why these last two events have happened in Russia and not anywhere else, <laughs> It's not a coincidence. Russia's big. It's because Russia is so big, exactly. The Tunguska area in Chelyabinsk are over 1,500 miles or 2,400 square uh, or 2,400 kilometers apart, so not exactly right next to each other. There may have been loads of smaller asteroids that burst over the ocean, and nobody ever knew. NASA is also working on a near-Earth object surveyor, a space telescope which is aiming to be completed by 2028. This will be tasked with looking at potentially dangerous asteroids and comets, though again, the Chelyabinsk meteor was much smaller than the stuff the telescope will be concentrating on, so I suppose we're all just hanging on by the skin of our teeth. In the end, while it's always fun to speculate, the Tunguska event has been satisfactorily explained for a long time, and we just have to cross our fingers and hope that it doesn't happen again. The truth is out there, and in this case, at least, it definitely wasn't aliens it's never aliens and also whether it happens again it's definitely happening again it's gonna happen again it happens many times like it's only been 10 years since the last one and it's gonna happen we just have to hope it doesn't hit some like mega super populated city or something all right well thanks for being here hope you enjoyed the episode and i'll see you next time